Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the service tonight. I invite you to take your songbooks and turn to page 252. Let's all stand. We're going to sing There is Power in the Blood. It's 252 in your songbooks. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you are evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. Power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus your there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power in the precious blood of the especially as we come into this time of year where we're recognizing your resurrection. Lord, we're thankful tonight for the sacrifice that you made on the cross of Calvary, the blood that you shed and all that you did to make salvation accessible to us. Lord, thank you for not only giving us access to salvation, but through salvation for giving us access to the Father. And Lord, we pray that you would give us tonight uh, just a, a wonderful service in this place, Lord, and in, we know there are folks who are watching online. We pray that you'd bless them as well, and Lord, we just ask that as we meet here this evening, you would minister to us, you would meet with us, Lord, and that you would give us exactly what we needed when we came in. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. And good singing tonight on a Wednesday night. Would you take your songbooks, turn to page 442. My Father planned it all. Page number 442. What though the way be lonely and dark the shadows fall, I know where'er it leadeth. My Father planned it all. I sing through the shade and the sunshine. I'll trust Him whatever befall. I sing for I cannot be silent, my Father planned it all. There may be sunshine tomorrow, shadows may break and flee. It will be the way He chooses, the Father's plan for me. I sing through the shade and the sunshine, I'll trust Him whatever befall. I sing for I cannot be silent, my Father planned it all. A day of light and gladness, on which no shade will fall. Tis this at last awaits me, my Father planned it all. I sing through the shade and the sunshine, I'll trust Him whatever befall. I sing for I cannot be silent, my Father planned it all. Hey, wonderful singing tonight. We're going to invite the ushers to come and bring a prayer page to anyone who did not receive one yet. We'll get this to you tonight. And a few new requests. There's also a missionary prayer letter that was made available to you when you walked in. And if we need to make some more of those up, or if there are some left, we can get you one. Uh, but that is for Brian and Chrissy Baggett with the United States Military Missions through BIMI. And uh, these are good people. I, I would love to have the Baggetts come back and give us a report in person. Uh, but they are constantly in and out of the country going to
to different military bases all around the world, and we're thankful that we can uh, help them and assist them by supporting them. And so pray for them if you would. There's a report on what's been going on through their ministry, and make sure that uh, you take an opportunity uh, to get to know a little bit more about them through that page. Uh, I want to mention a word very quickly about the Spring share As of right now, we are standing at $39,867 raised, and so praise the Lord for that. That's tremendous progress this week, and we're excited to see how that continues to climb all the way to our goal by the end of the week of $100,000. That helps us. Those are operating expense funds for our radio station, and so we sharpen our pencils, and we do everything we can, then we put the plea out every year this time of year, and so many folks have already responded. If you have not and you'd like to, uh, there are still some of these that are available. Available. They're spread throughout the auditorium uh, in those seat pockets there. If you see one, you'd like to make your pledge and fill that out tonight, you can put it in the offering plate, and that way you can make us aware of what you intend to do. Uh, but continue to pray and continue to listen. And uh, I want to say thanks to everybody who's brought food this week. This is by far, this has been, I mean, we've been living in luxury this week with all the people that have brought the food by, starting with the Donut Bank Donuts, by the way, that we worked really hard to, oh, by the way, Brother Flowers is here, that we worked really hard to uh, 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 to solicit, uh, but we've had a lot of great, uh, great things with that this week. Don't forget about Easter, and these cards are in the back. There are just a few stacks of these left. We will replenish these for Sunday, and we're going to have a way for you on Sunday. If you would like to send a text message to someone and just say, hey, I want to invite you to Easter uh, at Faithway Baptist Church, we're going to have a way for you to do that through our website, and so it's something new that we're working on, and this last week leading up to Easter services, March 31st, uh, we'll be pushing hard to get all these invitations out. Saturday morning, 9.30, we're going to get as many out as we can next Saturday as well. Uh, but then we also have our Easter egg hunts on Saturday this year. And so the Easter egg hunts are not, there's no Easter egg hunts on Sunday this year. And just the way that we're changing the service schedule, which as I didn't mention earlier, but we know the two service schedule by now, 9.30 and 11 uh, for the morning schedule. uh, We figured we'd probably just move that back a day for the Easter egg hunts, take some pressure off of that day. Uh, And uh, I don't know if you're like us or not, but probably uh, grandma's going to have an Easter egg hunt in the yard after church anyway. And so the kids are going to be all over the place. Now, we're also hosting this for the community, we're putting ours right before Easter because I've noticed that a lot of these other churches in town are doing them three and four weeks in advance. I want ours to be the very last one they come to, and we're going to invite them to the next day and try to get them to come and be a part of that. Uh, but we plan to have several hundred kids here, and we have 12,000 Easter eggs, most Easter eggs we've ever had for an Easter egg hunt, and we're excited about that day. And so that's March 30th, March 31st, this Sunday. We'll have the Lord's Table in the evening service next Wednesday. Uh, there is a spaghetti dinner fundraiser for the teenagers before church. It starts at 5.45, goes to 6.30, and just a good time of fellowship. Uh, And you can take a look on that back table of all of the different things you can sign up for and be involved in. We're going to move things along tonight. After this song, we'll have the offering. And then instead of having our normal prayer time, uh, Brother Flowers is going to come and just give a brief update and show a video about some of the things that they've been seeing uh, with their ministry. And so we're excited to hear from them tonight. Always a blessing have some of our missionaries in. Uh, Not only is he here to give a report, but he's also been active on the air and will be through tomorrow evening, I believe, and they take off on Friday. It's good to have Jesse and the kids here. They're not not kids anymore, uh, but we're glad that they're here tonight, the whole family with us this evening. Let's keep singing tonight if we could, please. We're going to sing the first and the last verse of Faith is the Victory. It's page number 482 in your songbook, 482. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all your strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame. We'll vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' 
conquering name. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Hey, let's pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, Lord, so much for allowing us to be back in your house on Wednesday night. Lord, I pray that uh, you'll just watch over, guide, and protect all of the different activities that we have going on downstairs from the kids to the teenagers and, of course, what's going on here in the auditorium. Pray, Lord, that you will uh, bless uh, Brother Stephen as he brings uh, tonight's message. Lord, as we uh, are taking up tonight's offering, we pray, Lord, that you'll bless it. Please bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Chamberlain. Appreciate that tonight. Brother Flowers, why don't you come? He's going to give us just a brief update, a verbal update for a moment, and then has a video to share with us tonight. And the Flowers, as many of us know, some of you have... have
started, people are still being saved, even where it's really hard. And that's an awesome testimony. Appreciate the flowers' faithfulness and them being here tonight. It's an honor for us to have them. If you find your place in the book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to begin reading in a verse where we found ourselves in last week. But I'd like for us to go and get our Bibles ready. And let's read together Ecclesiastes 5. We'll start in verse 18 this evening. We're going to talk about the struggle for satisfaction tonight. The struggle for satisfaction. Let's begin in verse 18, and then we'll read the entire, the entire chapter of chapter 6. It says, Behold that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink, and to enjoy the good of all of his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. For he shall not much remember the days of his life, because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. There is an evil which I see under the sun, and it is common among men. A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. If a man begat an hundred children and live many years so that the days of his years be many and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. For he cometh in with vanity and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor known anything. This hath more rest than the other. Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. For what hath the wise more than the fool? What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. That which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. Seeing there be many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? For who knoweth what is the good for man in in this life, all the days of his vain life which he spendeth as a shadow, for who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? Father, I pray that you please bless the time we have remaining tonight. Thank you for our friends, the flowers who are here tonight, the good update we saw. Lord, our prayer is that you would continue to work in the ministries and in the lives of our missionaries. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to see in this passage of Scripture tonight something that we can learn and make application to our lives so that we can walk more closely with you and more like you in this world that we're in today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for following along in the scripture this evening. We're going to be in chapter 5. We were in chapter 5 last week. And really, chapters 5 and 6 have the same theme, and they're kind, of, they're kind of tied together. And the idea of the two chapters would be this, that not all prosperity is good. Now, we talked a little bit about money last week, and I told you that the Bible says a lot about money. It actually says more about money than many other topics that we would think are more important. And I would say they are, but God chose to put in his word more about the topic of money than he did about some other things. For instance, 16 out of 38 of Christ's parables deal with money, deal with treasures. More is said in the New Testament about money than heaven and hell combined. That one's an ironic one to me. I have a, I have a thought about why that might be. And that is because money may do more to send people to hell and keep people out of heaven than any other earthly thing. Amen. And then we saw where five times more is said about money than prayer. There are 500 plus verses on prayer and faith in the Bible and over 2,000 verses dealing with money and possessions. Why is that? Well, Jesus gives us the answer to that. We covered this last week, but Jesus is the one who said, where your treasure is, there will your what? Heart be also. Our heart follows what we invest in. Uh, That's why I enjoy always seeing updates from missionaries, because it shows us what is that eternal return on our investment. And when we invest in what God cares about, I heard Brother Wilkerson say many times, I, I got my old Bible college Bible out here recently, It was the one that I had, I would sit through all the classes with it, and I would sit in chapel, and uh, Brother John Wilkerson, who is Lydia's dad, uh, he was one of my teachers in Bible college. 
And I have more in the back of my Bible written in sentences and, and quotes from him than I do from anyone else. I don't know why that is other than he must just be really good at spiritual one-liners. That's all, all I can figure. But he used to say, if you get a vision for God's big world, he'll get a vision for your little world. And that carries a lot of truth with it, that when we care about what God cares about, God starts to care about all the little details of our lives as well. And so there's a reason why Solomon is dealing with the issue of money and, and, and the issue of prosperity, and he's warning us. So this is a caution. It is not a caution against finances or a caution against having money. It's a caution against having the wrong mindset about money. And so five specific principles. If you weren't here last week, I'll give them to you very carefully, very quickly. The first one is this. Money makes a terrible friend. Money is not a good friend to the people who have it. Money is nothing but a burden. It uses us and leaves us completely unsatisfied and unfulfilled. The second principle, this one is, is to me somewhat funny, but money is not only a terrible friend, money makes friends terrible. Because if you get money, and if you get a lot of money, I don't know what the lottery is because I don't play the lottery, uh, but if you won the lottery, you would have a line outside of your house. Now, if you asked me right now and said, Pastor, could you pay my mortgage for me? I would gladly tell you, no, I cannot do that. But you would understand because I didn't have the, I didn't have the lottery money. Uh, I, hypothetically, if I won the lottery and I told you no, and you knew I had the money to do it, you would be furious with me because you knew I could and then I didn't. So money makes terrible friends. Money makes friends terrible. The prodigal son learned that one. Uh, then we learned that more money equals more stress every time. It doesn't matter in the scenario, it doesn't matter what the circumstance is, but it always brings with it more responsibility. With, with that comes stress and concern, and more money also equals less security. You would think that if you had more money, you would be more secure, but the Bible says, generally speaking, that's not the case. We're all just one event away from losing it all anyway, which is why the book of James says that uh, riches make themselves wings and fly away. They're just, they're just not around very long. And, of course, the age-old cliche that we gave at the end, you cannot take it with you. So those are the five principles of money. Money is a terrible friend. Money makes friends terrible. More money equals more stress. More money equals less security. And you can't take it with you. We gave all those to you last week. Uh, but I want to stay with this thought. It's the same line of thinking, but the principles are going to expand beyond just dollar amounts to having a, a, a proper perspective on possessions or a proper perspective on prosperity. Now, as I was thinking about how to illustrate this, and we've already read the text, so I can give you this illustration, uh, everyone here would know that we have four children. And I grew up in a home where m my parents were in ministry and my grandfather was the pastor, and so I know what it's like to have my grandfather or my father use me as their sermon illustration. And I cannot wait to pass that joy along to my children as well and help them with their, all of their issues in life, you know, or create the issues. But uh, for the sake of the illustration, I'm gonna take my daughter out of the picture for a moment, and we're just gonna talk about the three boys. We have on occasion, on many occasions now, we pack food bags for different reasons. For instance, we'd pack a, a, a lunch for their school every day. We would pack uh, packs of food or snacks, we call them snack bags, uh, for the airplane uh, trips that we would take to, to go back to home to visit Cheryl's family. And, and if, if, if any of you young moms want to know what my wife does with that, I mean, it's, it's literally, it's like, it's amazing. You know, she gets those big gallon zipper bags and she has a whole thing and a list and all this stuff. And, and she's just real organized about it. Of course, take the boys hunting, you know, we try to pack them snacks and things like that. Now, the best possible outcome, okay, here's the, here's the point of the illustration. The best possible outcome only happens if each one of those three boys gets exactly the same stuff in their bag. Okay, this is not even, there, nobody, nobody's going to disagree with me on this. No parents are going to disagree with me on this. Because they are mostly, if not completely, identical in content. In other words, we don't do a survey beforehand and say, Jude, what would you like in your snack bag? And Eli, what would you like in your snack bag? No, we've got a list. It's a generous list, in my opinion. My wife puts everything in the bag, and she says, this is our saying in the house, we get what we get, and we don't throw a fit. All right, so that's our statement to the kids and if we ever start hearing any complaining, then uh, we just say, say it with us, and we sing it together. And they just roll their eyes, and then they get in trouble for rolling their eyes, you know. It, it is a little bit like provoking your children to wrath, Brother McQuarrie, but we enjoy every moment of it. 
Now, here's the point of this, okay? Every parent in the room knows why we do this. If you want a fight to break out, especially among three boys, especially among my three boys, let's get specific for a moment, just pack them all different snacks. Because what are they going to do? They're all sitting there on the airplane. Everything's going great. They're looking out the window. Everybody's happy. All of a sudden, a fight breaks out in the aisle of the airplane. The stewardess comes by and says, get these kids under control. Why? Because we pack different snacks for each kid. And they all looked in everyone else's bag. And they said, why didn't I get that? I want that. I want that. And then, then you get the, the real, the real uh, uh, smart ones. They say, well, I'll trade you one of these for two of those. And always the youngest gets gypped. Well, he's got to grow up somehow. That's the, that's the job of the older brothers is to teach them the ways of life, you know, and teach them street smarts. And so these things happen, right? But here's the thing. We keep it consistent. We keep everything packed real nice and neat, real consistent in order to avoid conflict. But God doesn't do it that way. God doesn't pack the same thing in my bag that he packs in your bag. God does it different, different for all of us. Let me give you something to think about tonight. I'm told, I'm not, a, I'm not a language expert, so uh, I, I, in, in the research that I did on this, I found that the Hebrew language from which this text comes did not have or does not have superlatives. In other words, if we said something was good and then there was something else that was good but it was a little more good, we would say it was better. And then if, if you know, the, finish the saying, it's good, better, Best, right. So you have those superlatives, right? We have a way of, of uh, uh, expanding the value of something by how we define it. And, and so it, that's how our language works. But in this Hebrew language, in order to communicate that something was not just good, but it was really good, you just say it twice or you say it more than once. And so if something was really holy or the most holy, it would be called the what? Holy of holies. Exactly. Exactly. Or if we served a God who was the king and he was greater than all of the other kings, he would be the king of kings. And, and that's how the language works. So what we would learn from that is that the first mention and the last mention are the most important words in the statement, whatever the statement may be. Now, think about this. In the Ten Commandments tonight, go to the book of Exodus and you see the Ten Commandments. Jesus summarized all of the commandments by making them into two. The first one was to love the Lord our God, all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. The second is what? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Upon these two hang all of the law and the prophets. But if you looked at the ten that we were given in the book of Exodus to the people of Israel, you would find that at the beginning, it's to have no other gods. They would be written in the negative. You don't do this. Don't do this. So don't have any other gods. No other gods. There's only one God. The Lord our God is one God. Okay? He, is, he is the only God. What's the last commandment? Thou shalt not... Come on. This is not Sunday school. You know what it is. Thou shalt not covet envy. What is the enemy of satisfaction? Covetousness. Envy. One of the best ways to maintain a love for your neighbor is to not covet or envy what's in their bag. It's to keep your eyes upon what God gives to you. But we have a tendency to inspect everyone else's snack bag. We want to know if someone else got a better portion than we did. And then when that happens, we fail to appreciate what God does for us. So this passage of Scripture is pretty amazing. As I was studying through it, I was immediately struck by a clear disparity between the first three verses that we read and then the first two verses of chapter 6. Let's look at them again if we could. It says in verse number 18, it says, Behold that which I have seen. So Solomon is calling attention. He's saying, look at this. Everybody study. I did a, I did a case study on this. Now I want you all to see it for yourselves. Behold that which I have seen, and this is what he saw. It is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all of his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life. What are the next four words? Ready? Which God giveth, for it is his what? It is his, it's his snack bag. It's what God gave him. 
And then it says in verse 19, and this is, this is outstanding. You've got you to watch this because this is going to be very key when we see what happens in chapter 6 and verse 2. It says in verse 19 of chapter 5, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him the power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. Finish the verse with me. Ready? This is the it's the gift of God. It's the blessing of God. For God to give us riches and wealth and the power to eat thereof. Now, we're, we're going to get to this verse in a little bit, and we'll probably refer to it more than once. But there's a reason that he's using the metaphor of food. It's because he says in verse 7, all the labor of man is for his mouth. It all boils down to one thing. If you have money and there's a famine, you're going to use your money to do what? Buy food. Okay, at the end of the day, if it really came down to that, we would take all of our money and put it on food because we cannot survive without food. And so all of man's labor is ultimately for his mouth, is what the Bible is saying here, both literally and then repetitively throughout the Scripture in, in a variety of ways. Look at verse 20. This same man who God has given riches and wealth, in verse 19, shall not much remember the days of his life because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. Now, we just saw a picture in three verses of a man who was extremely blessed of God, with both materialistically but also relationally. That last verse, it, it essentially tells us this, that you're not going to remember that award that you get at work for climbing the ladder of success. At the end of your life, you're going to remember the joy that you had when enjoying the, the, the blessings of God with your family Amen. and with the people you love. The Bible says God answers him in the joy of his heart. When you are reflecting, as Solomon, Solomon is at the end of his life. And it, for that day, he was an old man, okay? And now I, I have to say that because he was only 59, all right? But for that day, that was, that was, he, he had made it as far as he was going to go. I mean, this, this was it. Now, in this, he says, when I think back, I don't think about how I got all of these projects done and how I was the most successful builder in Israel and how I did this or did that. He didn't think about all the accolades. He remembered the most important moments of life, the joyful moments of life, the times that meant more than the money. And there's a lot of things in life that mean more than money, by the way. Amen. Now, this man, chapter 519, was given riches and wealth. Look at chapter 6. In verse 1, it says, there is an evil which I have seen under the sun. He goes from saying, look at what I have seen in chapter 5 and look at the goodness of God. Look at the blessings of God. Look at the enablement of God to saying in chapter 6 verse 1, look at this evil upon the earth. Here we go again. Every once in a while Solomon kind of wakes out of, his, out of his coma of depression and meaninglessness. And that's what happened in verses 18, 19, and 20 of chapter 5. He said, whoa, man, there, there, there is meaning in life, but now he's back under the sun again. And he says, there's an evil which I've seen under the sun, and it's common among men. And here it is, verse 2, a man to whom God hath given, what does he give him? He gives him, first of all, what? Riches. And then he gives him wealth, and then honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desires. Now, hold on. Let me ask you this tonight. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Solomon. Solomon's talking about himself. Who was the man in this, in this text who had riches and wealth and honor and all that his soul desired? Oh, we don't have time to go back to chapter 3, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was chapter 3, right, where he went through all the different things that he acquired and he, he took and he, he tried to fill the void in his heart or in his life with those things. And we walked through that whole list of things. We don't have time to go back to it tonight. But this is Solomon. He says, there's a man over here who has riches and wealth. And God answers him in the joy of his heart. And then there's another man, just pointing his finger at himself, who has riches and wealth and honor and everything his soul desires. But look at this. Yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof. Now, I just want to make sure we don't miss this, and so allow me to be thorough, which is a fancy way of saying allow me to repeat myself. 
in verse 19, this man had riches and wealth, and God gave it to him. And then it says, God hath given him power to eat thereof. Verse 2 of chapter 6, God giveth him not the power to eat thereof, but this man, a stranger, eateth it. This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. Hmm. To one God gave riches and wealth, the other he gave riches, wealth, honor, and all his soul desired. To the first, he rejoiced in his labor and acknowledged it as a gift from God. To the other, he had everything that he could ever want, but God didn't give him the power to eat of it. Instead, a stranger would devour it. So this would be like saying that at the first man's funeral, all of his children stood up and bragged on dad. And they just spent hour after hour after the funeral talking about all the good lessons, life lessons they learned from dad. And they talked about how great he was to live with and how he spent time with them and how he invested in them and, and how that he, sure, he had some tough love from time to time, but it was always for their good. And they aspire to continue the legacy of their father. The second man, his funeral's a little bit different. The family picks the cheapest coffin. They can afford a lot more because dad left a lot of wealth behind, but eh, dad wouldn't want to waste his money on the coffin. And then during the, the sermon or the eulogy, they're all checking their watches thinking, when is this over? we got to meet with the lawyer and get this estate figured out so we can divide up the inheritance. And they just say, well, we're glad this is over. You know, he's better off. And they say all the, all the words that we all want to hear. They go straight to the lawyer's office. They collect on dad's estate so they can have all the money that he left behind. You see, that's the disparity between the two. So how, how, do, how are we able to be the first guy and not the second guy? That's the question, right? Okay, here it is. First of all tonight, letter A, the ability to exert labor comes from God. Look at verse 18 of chapter 5 again. Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and drink and enjoy the good of all of his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which who giveth him? God. Who giveth him? God. God. He acknowledges that it's a gift of God. The first man realizes that it all comes from the Lord. Even the ability to exert labor. That means to exert effort. Now, I think about this man and I think of what Jesus said in Matthew 16. What is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This man, he invested in the right place because he recognized where it came from. And then secondly, God not only gives us the ability to labor, he also gives us the capacity to enjoy life. Because that's listed in chapter 19, or chapter 5, verse 19. It says, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. It would really help all of us if we viewed, this, is, this goes for whether you have much or little. It would help all of us if we viewed what we had as enough. And it would help all of us if we understood that whatever is given to us was given to us by God, even the ability to earn Amen. and labor and work. And then beyond that, you say, well, I not only want to work, I want to enjoy all of the, the fruit of my labor. That, see, a lot of people work. A lot of people lay up wealth. A lot of people, they know how to make the money. But most of those same people never enjoy yep. the fruit of their labor. Yep. And the reason for that is because you can only enjoy it if God lets you. That's what it says, God gave him the power to eat thereof. Ecclesiastes 2 verse 24 says, There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. Man shoulders the responsibility to enjoy the fruit of our labor and God gives the capacity to do so. Then there's secondly tonight, this is, this is in the text and I want to be sensitive to it but I also want you to see the actual meaning of it, because it's a very harsh comparison that he makes. He compares, and maybe I should have used the word a harsh metaphor, but he says in verse number three, he says, if a man begat a hundred children, now you say, wait a minute, already this sounds terrible. <laughs> it's the difference in cultures. Because in the day, of, in Solomon's day, the success of a man was viewed 
by number one, how many children he had, and number two, how long he lived. There are a lot of verses in the Bible that says he, who, he who will live a long, he lived a long life and saw good days. You know, that kind of idea is all throughout the Old Testament. And that was the, that was the measuring stick, so to speak, of, of how successful a man was. It's, it is amazing how things have changed, but really it all boils down to the same concept. And that is that society is going to dictate how they view you, no matter what. Okay? And so in that day, it was children and years lived. They didn't have modern medicine, so if you lived, you must have been living right. Okay, that was the idea. And so these two symbols of success, the number of children you had, the years you lived, if you had lots of children and lived to an old age, you were successful. So the man in verse 3 has 100 children and lives for 2,000 years. This man doesn't really exist. It's just Solomon's way of of expressing the principle in verse uh in verse uh let me see here verse number six though he live a thousand years twice old so so there's the picture of the man he has a hundred children lives for two thousand years so he is really successful but the bible says but his soul was not filled with good it makes a little statement in there in verse three it says and his soul be not filled with good it also that he have no burial what was that all about well not having a burial in that day was indicative of a completely disrespected or disregarded individual and you would probably know this that's still the case in certain cultures for the flowers to die without honor or to die without mourning we talked about lazarus and how they would hire mourners and how there were um, there were uh, seven days of intense mourning and another 21 days beyond that or 20 days or so uh, beyond that. And we had someone in the service the other day that said, where I come from, it's six days of mourning. So cultures everywhere still do this. But the idea is that if you were a really important person, they would absolutely mourn your loss. This man, he lived a hundred, or he had a hundred children, lived 2,000 years, and no one went to his funeral. Nobody cared. Why? His days were not filled with good. He looked successful, but he was truly not. And here's what Solomon says in verse 3. I want to be sensitive about this tonight. It says, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. So let me say what that means rather than describing it. I think we understand it. Solomon is saying here, it would be better for this man to die before he sees the sun than to live under the sun and waste his life. That's the metaphor. And like I said, it's harsh. It's really harsh. Verse 7 says, All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. Here's the principle. If you have it all, but you can't enjoy it, then life is meaningless. I was talking to someone today, and they were talking about the book of of, uh, Ecclesiastes, and they had a friend. They said, hey, you should read this, Ecclesiastes. And they came back and said, that was terrible. I mean, it's just negative and, and, and depressing. It's like, well, yeah, okay, but understanding it helps you understand and, and grow in your faith, actually, because the, the principles are there. It may be a bit harder to interpret this book, but it's a powerful lesson on what is really important, what really counts. Absolutely. So you have this harsh comparison, and then lastly tonight, I want us to see the critical element of contentment. Contentment. Look at verse 9. <laughs> Here it is. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. I'm sorry, go to verse 8. Uh, For what hath the wise more than the fool? What hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? And then verse 9, verse 10. That which hath been is named already. It is known that it is man. Neither may he contend with him that is mightier than he. Verse 12. Who knoweth what is good for man in this life? All the days of his vain life which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? Okay, think about this. There's a, few, there's a few principles of contentment we have to understand here. The first principle is this. You cannot handle more of a thing until you can handle what you have. That's a biblical principle. So you might use it this way. If you aren't, you aren't ready to be married until you learn how to enjoy being single. That would be a good way of communicating this thought. You aren't ready to be rich until you can handle being poor. And that's biblical as well. Paul wrote that to the Philippians, didn't he? He said in Philippians 4, 11, he said, not that I speak in respect of want. So he was a fundraiser. Well, he was a missionary, so of course he was a fundraiser. 
But Paul was very specific. He said, this is not for me. I don't, I don't need this. This is I, Not that I speak in respect of want. In other words, don't get the idea that I'm just, it's just all about me. Here's what he says. I have learned in whatsoever state or condition I am th- therewith, <clears throat> excuse me, to be what? And then he goes on and says, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. You see these professional athletes who go from college right into the professional sports world, and you hear of so many of them who get in trouble or uh, they kind of they flame out because they don't have their financial, um, uh, they don't have wisdom in how they handle that sudden wealth. Right, it's crazy we live in America today, in a place where you can go from being a nobody to making hundreds of thousands, if not millions and millions and millions of dollars, in many cases overnight. By the way, those are the people who would tell you that everything Solomon said is true. But Solomon, or excuse me, Paul said, he said, I know how to live on nothing, and I know how to live when I have more than enough. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. And he says, everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry. I don't know if you're starting to put this together or not, especially based on what we hear, uh, what we've heard over the last several weeks. He said, I know how to be full and to be hungry. I know how to abound and I know how to suffer need. But that's when, immediately following this phrase, we read that great verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Oh, here's the problem. We like to put that that verse on our t-shirts and go out and say, well, I'm going to invest in this because I can do all things, or I'm going to try this new, this new uh, project or this new plan or this whatever. You have to tie it to the Scripture. Paul said, I can literally live on next to nothing if God strengthens me to do so. It's the same idea as what Solomon was saying. He said, it's the gift of God. It's the gift of God. Paul said what Solomon's trying to say. You cannot handle more until you handle what you have. Now, that is reiterated again in the New Testament when Jesus is telling the story of the man, the master who has three servants, and giving them the, the, the balance of the talents. And to one of the servants, his Lord said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Are are you starting to see the connection? Okay, because I'm seeing it more and more the more I talk. I'm not impressed with what I'm saying. I'm just saying the more I talk through this, I'm seeing that the connection between contentment and joy is all throughout the Bible, everywhere. Okay, we live in the wealthiest nation on earth with the highest rates of depression and anxiety. Why? I think we know why. You say, what is contentment? Define it for me. Okay, right now at the end, I'll say that and give you hope, but I will end it. Contentment is the ability to say, I need nothing more in order to enjoy my life. I need nothing more. Having therefore fruit and raiment, let us therefore be content. Look at verse 9 and we're done. This is a beautiful verse and I want us to take this verse as the, as the nail in the, in, the, in the final board tonight. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. That's a proverb. What does it mean? Let me reword it so we can understand it a little more clearly tonight. It means it's better to see what you have and be content than to crave what you want but can't have. If all we do is sit around all day and think about what could have been, what might have been, it's a miserable life. The Bible says, see what God has given you and appreciate it. See what God has given you and realize that what you've been given is far far greater than what you deserve. It's kind of cliche now, but how you doing? Better than I deserve. That's exactly right. It's better to see what you have and enjoy it than to crave what you want but can't have. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not think ill. This is the definition we gave earlier. I think I gave it earlier. 
to a feeling of discontent or ill will because of another's advantage. The difference between covetousness, that feeling of discontent or ill will because of another's advantage, and contentment, which is the ability to say, I don't need anything more, is to understand where it comes from. It is the gift of God. Can I say this tonight? I think we ought to have spiritual ambition and crave more. I I think Jabez is a fantastic uh, example of this where he said, Lord, enlarge my coasts. Give us more. But that was for God, not for Jabez. That was for God. We have such a twisted view of prosperity. Let's not fall into the unbiblical. Money is not a sinful thing to have. It is sinful to have the wrong perspective on it. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for your word. And Lord, if we really believe your word, then we'll believe what Paul wrote when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Lord, thank you not only for the gift of of Jesus, thank you not only for the gift of salvation and for the gift of heaven, but thank you for the gift of the here and now. Help us to live life joyfully. Help us to live life with contentment. They are the same. Help us not to be looking around upset at whatever other people have in their snack bag. But rather, Lord, help us to be grateful for what you have given to us by your gracious hand. Thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. And we ask you to help us to remember this in the days ahead when we're tempted to covet or envy. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for coming out. It's been a good Wednesday night. Don't forget to pick up your kids, those little blessings downstairs. We are dismissed. Thank you so much. Thank you.